I don't think a lot of people realize that here we are training ourselves to paint in the dark, like 50, 60, yeah. whatever feet. If we're doing a whole car, you're doing a half a car, you know, you're doing like 18 foot by five foot in the dark with all these obstacles in your way. I feel blessed today when I look back and I say, wow, that's my training. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Laser Jam and Killer Keller Podcast striking down on you with great vengeance once again. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight, everybody's got a television app on our free download business. Um, yo, uh, graffiti as a passion, I swear to God, in my day, I never thought there'd be a time where I'd be com- connecting with someone transatlantic that I would clearly defined as a pioneer and early doors veteran of the graffiti scene in the u.s hold tight stash in the building what's good family i'm good man thanks for having me how are you sir oh good i don't think my my intro just can't do this i mean we've got a conversation this doesn't do it justice does it <laughs> okay it's just uh you know it's the like you said, it's the introduction. Now let's dig in a little bit and see what's on your mind. But by the way, big shout out to Philip Leeds, mutual friend. Big time. Hold Philip time. Leeds, if you don't know, big shots. Get the book. Hell yeah, big shots. That's the one. Um, amazing book uh, by an amazing gentleman. And it's taken me like the best part of this weekend to try and figure out, well, how do I... How do you begin conversating? You know, this is the big up moment, bro. I swear to God. Like, where do you begin having a conversation with someone that's pretty much done it all? When you think of street art, you were there before street art. When you think of graph, you were there at the inception of it. Like Slightly after. Pardon the inter- interruption, but just slightly, you know, as we get, you'll see when we dig into the layers of it. And where to begin with these layers, you know? I mean, how's it feel for you? as a creative first and foremost to have been given the tools at that early um uh at the early stage in your career that's just like okay this is spray paint this is this is the surface okay let's go to town on it how was that for you when you saw the, 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 that world come into you know new york i mean you know for me i'm a little younger than the earlier generations right so where i place on that time chart there was a lot of discovery already happened. Mm. When I stepped in, it was probably, you know, like the early 80s. And by then, you know, the development of what was a very simple, loose outline turned into wild style, what we call wild style piecing and all that, you know? Mm. So I saw a lot of early subway art. It wasn't until like the, like I say, the late 70s, very early 80s of taking the train to school and Mm -hmm. starting to decipher what I was staring at, not knowing what it was, you know, and just sort of investigating. And that's how I sort of learned. And so for me, I feel blessed today when I look back and I say, wow, that's my training. I didn't go to art school. Mm -hmm. I learned from my peer group. I learned by people I respected and looked up to. It it was a different period of time back then. Life was a little slower, you know, Mm -hmm. before things commodified, before you were getting paid for what you did. It was a a passion movement. And, you know, as Scheme so poetically put it in Star Wars, we didn't do it to go to Paris. You know, we, we sort of did it back then because that's, that's all we knew. We didn't, we didn't have that. You know, if you ask somebody in 1982, the five-year plan, I don't believe email, internet, uh, travel, you know, those things, you know, really, we didn't see that far. And, and those sort of things weren't part of the daily conversation. You know, it was more of like, yo, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get known. It was like branding before we knew what branding was, right? You pick your name, you get it up around the city, you try and develop a style. So people yeah. can identify you by your style. Oh, that looks like this guy's work, you know, consistency, trial and error, you got to fall before you can run, dude. You know, there was a lot of like, you know, we're here celebrating, but prior to that celebration, you know, it didn't always work out so well. And 
you know, we put the time in, but I'm one of many, many, many artists that came from that period of time. And so I feel blessed of being around and sort of folded in to like that generation that people sort of revere when they think of the graffiti movement, the early subway movement. They don't go far enough back the way we as the artists do to yeah. give that respect to the elder statesmen of our movement. But mm. that introduction to the subway art, those beautiful whole cars and all that movement that people celebrated, certainly in Europe and Asia and, you know, a lot of publications back then, mm. it wasn't celebrated here. It was like, oh, shit, vandals. Oh, my God. But people sort of recognize from the outside in. And that was the period that I was turned on to because of my age and when I entered the scene. So yeah, hey, I get credit because I'm part of a movement, but mm. I'm not so early in that movement to carry that weight. I'm, I'm after the foundation was built, I might be one of the structures that sort of erected to sort of get that next layer up on that foundation, right? So, you know, what I was able to do though in that time, I believe is what I'm being called upon or called out for, we talk about, because I took notice yeah. and I was, you know, blessed by being around some of the best to ever do it. And I, sure. I sort of took what I got from them and gave it back right back out. So, you know, we all sort of draw from the same pool of inspiration, books or the comics, or watch the same movies, tell the same joke, but we all laugh at it differently, right? It's what we do <laughs> that when we take it in and put it back out that defines us. And that's my long-winded answer about what graffiti did to me because it it defined me. It gave me purpose. It gave me life. And now, sure. longevity, it gave me career. So in such a in such a major way. Going back to what you were saying about the um, the elder statesman and you being one of the kind of um, one of the pillars of of the scene. Um, it, it's somewhere in that structure. There were definitely telltales of like early earlier creatives and then adopters but i think from from an international standpoint as i'm sure you'll you'll appreciate it's like when you have so so much coming at you at once time become time becomes a nothing it's weird it doesn't it's not irrelevant but time becomes this is a constant it's a it's a jet stream of of artistry and and the fault lines in which you guys have in, uh, introduced within the scene are obviously a little bit more blurred. It was before internet and there was so much going on and New York as a whole, uh, well, being the media center it is, it just, it, it, it just took everything that you guys were doing and just threw it out there into the world. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I remember on the reverse side of that, seeing what was happening in, you know, Australia or the UK or, you know, even Asia at that point. But, you know, it was all, like we said, pre-internet. It was black and white. It was fanzines. It was homemade. Mm -hmm. All DIY. You would get a book of graffiti pieces and it's all black and white. You got to sit there and only imagine what their colors are like. Or, oh man, that would be dope if you used a red outline on that because that outline, whatever. You know, you just sort of, we didn't know, you know. It was definitely pre-internet. You know, it was pen pal shit. You know, like, shit, but with a hint of like you say the kind of punk esque fanzine DIY. Oh, the best! It was the best because it was all passion. It was all you know. Heads did it like to to just celebrate what we did. You know, like all the early. You know, I'm working on my first book. Right, I have never put a book out. I've I don't really blog. I don't really do. You know, I'm just kind of doing what I do. And I decided now's the time. Right, if I'm not I'm not going to do it and. Pre-COVID, mind you, I tried to start this prior. This actually actually helped and hurt the process, but, you know, here we are. And, you know, when I look back at, like, everything that I've done, it's only a reflection of what the movement is and, and how big and broad mm. movements become. And it is, to me, the origin is the New York City subway. And when you look back at the epicenter of, of where it started and where we are today, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's incredible. Talk to me back in the day of regards to the subway systems as a, as a young, as a young whipper back in the day, what, what were your immediate react? What was your immediate feeling? I'm trying to get into the, the, the zone, the headspace of, of a young you um, inf influenced on the surroundings and just seeing 
you know, what was the environment like? What was that feeling like in New York at the time for you and seeing Graph emerge the way it did? Well, you know, I did a lot of thinking about this recently. So having an answer, it might seem spontaneous, but because of my book and what I'm trying to communicate now, I, I've actually put thought on certain topics like that. Fantastic. So Wicked. It's not a freestyle. It's more of, I have thought about this a lot and, you know, taking the train to school was usually during rush hour, right? So the morning was rush hour, the afternoon, depending on what you did after school, before you got home, you might miss rush hour or you'd be in rush hour, but certainly during rush hour, you didn't get a full view of everything in the train, you know, short, you might get a seat, you might not, you see the graffiti in between all the commuters and people on the strap hangers. And man, that caught my eye so hardcore. I was like, what the fuck is all this shit? It just really blew my mind, you know, watching the, just the insides, the outsides. I hadn't even, that was too complex. I was like, they have to be allowed. That's like advertisement. It doesn't, it's so incredible that I didn't really know. But for me, it was really the insides because the more and more I took the train to school, I started identifying and being able to read. They became legible to me. And I was like, wow, I saw that guy's name yesterday in blue over the map. Today it's on the door with spray paint in red. Hey, what's going on here? You know, yeah. that kind of, it sort of started clicking to me like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, something, 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 something's going on. And here's what makes me crazy because I have thought about this and we've talked about it. My you know, friends who were helping me with the project. I think I was in seventh grade and I remember saying to one of my classmates, yo, are you, are you peeping this on the subway? And my dude was like, yeah, my younger brother writes graffiti. And I'm like, yo, your, your, wait, we're in seventh grade. Your younger brother has already gone to, and that's when I really first learned what the different sort of the vernacular of our movement, how graffiti writers talk to each other, what the mm. yards and the layups and the tunnels. And, you know, there, there's a whole language that was foreign to me because I didn't, I wasn't writing graffiti. I didn't know these guys. I didn't know what the, the handshake was or what have you, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm. you know, and so John Weiss, I remember, he's like, my brother Graham is already bombing the six train. Well, what's bombing? You know what I mean? Like, that's how newbie I was because yeah. it all sounds familiar now, but like, I'm taking us back to like, wait, what? Mm. You do, you make your own marker with a, an eraser that you steal from school. Wait, what? You know, like all this, you want to talk about like DIY early do it yourself shit. I mean, incredible. So yeah, that, that fascination just spiraled into like this amazing, Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole of what graffiti is today, right? Could you imagine falling in, seeing it and being really captivated, talking to some peers that are like, yeah, well, you know, heads are already doing this and that. Well, I, I need to know more. Yeah. How can I, how can I, how can I be down? Like what's going on? And that was my initial introduction. And here I'm still here. That's crazy. Oh God, so much to take away from that. Okay. It's an institute. <laughs> It was your institution. It's like, like you say from what well, you said, vernacular. Like, I remember seeing the Phase Two book, and he basically broke down all the kind of eubonics of, you know, of like what certain words meant, and you know where it would be phrased and shit. Uh, this was inv an invention. This reinvention of uh, language and what would be um, prison slang is now like a graffiti slang. And yeah, you you all these tricks and of the trade that you then have to figure out, okay, how did they get that brush so big on the marker pen? How did they get that can nozzle to be, what did they use? What, what was it like a, you know, like a hairspray cap? What was it? You know, all these different things. It must've blown your mind, man. It was, it was amazing. And, and as much as information was being traded and passed amongst the homies and friends, you know, like, we all had like older, I did anyway, my generation, I was surrounded by older writers yeah. that sort of took me in and was like, all right, I wasn't like the fucking chi, chi chihuahua like that, but like <laughs> you definitely were like the youngin, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Run this package across the street for me right quick type Prospect shit. Prospect shit, yeah. yeah and, and it was great because like, you know, it was, it was like, when I look back, I wish, and I'm, I'm so thankful that my son found skateboarding because skateboarding to me, is very similar yeah. in that sort of That's single right. set minded. You don't need a whole lot. You can yeah. 
create a lot with a very little amount to me. And I equate skateboarding to the same leap of faith I gave to the graffiti movement, oh, sure. the electricity and the illegality of running into subway tunnels, but just the brotherhood, the camaraderie or sisterhood, whatever it is, the friendships that are built through that community. And every skater is an artist, a musician, a singer. A po- I mean, yeah, they're always doing something else, aren't they? They're, that's they're, just like a byproduct of this shit. There's a group of people out there. They don't yeah, get yeah. enough props. And, you know, I'm so thankful because I look at what I was able to find, but that was in the like early 80s. I mean, that was, you know, we're talking a long time ago, you know, like worlds, the world's a much different place. It spins on a different axis now. Mm. You know, yeah, but we, we all had, we all had like, I had like, you know, the, that big brother, the older writer that was like, here's, here's how we do. Let me show you, let me take you, let me teach you, mm-hmm. you know, and little by little, those traditions sort of whittled away. And, you know, once it commodified my dude, it was mm-hmm. game on because everybody went for self, yeah. you know? So it wasn't like, yo, we're doing a community wall. It was like, oh, what? I'm getting paid for that. You know, you didn't call 10 of your homies. You were like, mm, I can handle that job because now you're <laughs> you're looking at like, how do I take what I did as a hobby? I did anyway. I watched. I was I was there still bombing trains when guys like Futura or Crash, Dondi, Rest in Peace, Zephyr, they were showing in galleries already. So I had like the best of both worlds to view at. And I was yeah. becoming close friends with some of these guys. So... I had firsthand view to like, oh, that's how, that's what your studio looks like. Oh, dope. Okay. I want a studio. I want to be able to paint. I want to take what I do on a 20, 30 foot side of a train and learn how to put it on a five foot canvas. Because that perspective isn't easy. I don't think a lot of people realize that here we are training ourselves to paint in the dark, like 50, 60, whatever feet. If we're doing a whole car, you're doing a half a car, you know, you're doing like 18 foot by five foot in the dark with all these obstacles in your way. And now you have to redo your craft on a, Hey, I want to do a, you know, a two foot canvas. Yeah. Well, I can't do it the way I'm trained to do it. Um, I got to relearn my craft or tone it down. Some artists start small and go big. I happen to just start writing graffiti. I didn't, I wasn't a, an artist where I had sketchbooks. I wasn't one of these illustrators that got into graffiti. A lot of different artists had interests at that time and already artistic abilities. Some like me started just learning a hand style and then a throw up and a, mm. you know, I didn't do art school. I didn't come from that. Some artists do, you know, we all come from a different place. And so I kind of learned it on the fly. So I kind of learned backwards, like, <laughs> oh shit, I could paint that really big if you want. You're like, well, no, we only, you only needed this. Like, well, how do, how, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, like it was, it was, it was pretty interesting at the time. Like I say, there's not always hits. There's a lot of fails, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you could say the same for Graf as well. You know, when you Anything go to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, it, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's, it's the industry in it, the industriousness of, of how graffiti artists work never fails to impress. And I do, I agree with you. You alluded to it and I'm with you. The, the uh, new form of marketing campaign or at least one from 80s onwards if if people had if, if companies had the same industriousness as graph writers did you know who cares if it's not right the first time we're doing it again and again and again repeat 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 that's something i take away from all of my work ethic you know i mean that's like a skater going down a, a flight of steps didn't land it didn't land it broke his ankle came back two weeks later didn't land it landed it you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's the same with the lettering or style. You're developing a style, you know, and you just progress and progress and progress, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's theory anyway, you know. Very good <laughs> uh, I think the other thing about gra- um, graffiti and skateboarding and the relationship is, uh, I think, I, I, or at least I love to think that parents still don't quite understand why kids of those two genres would want to do something for free at such a great cost <laughs> do you know I, what I mean I think, yeah but I think more more parents of this generation get it like yeah. I'm closer with my kids than I was with my parents mm. and we share more interest in music clothing the way we talk pop culture all the snapping and all the you know quick tongue stuff where we 
What'd you just say to me? Like, oh shit. Like, wow. That's like, cool. Heads are quick where our parents didn't celebrate it like that. You know? So I think that now just because of the more interest that we share with our children on that level, but purely because my son at 16 is like writing graffiti. My son at 16 is like, Oh wow. I get it, dad. You're actually, you put the time in. You're like, he's by doing and seeing little bits out in his world, he gets it. And it's really interesting to be appreciated by your children's peer group because, you know, you're always corny. You're just the dad. Yeah. Whatever. You're always dad. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But now his group of people start to recognize some of the things that I've worked on. Some of my input in the culture we're all sort of talking about. And it's inspiring to them, which is what I love hearing from my son the most. They're all like, oh, sh we can, oh my God. Yeah, so it's possible if we work on what we do. Look, his dad did it. It's not It's not foreign. We can, can be done, you know? Yeah. So that's what I like as their takeaway. You know, heads are sort of like really using their artistic abilities. Like my son's making fanzines, him and his boys do photo shoot. You know, they're all really... I use, I made up the term ingenuitous, but like, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're very smart with the tools that they're given. Certainly now there's a lot more tools in the chest than when we were coming up. Mm. And I'm really impressed to see how, you know, and what they're producing because they're all very eclectic and they're all really individual, but they share their individuality. They don't shit on each other for it. Like when we were coming up, when the word hate and the internet was, you know, <laughs> these guys have a much better way of celebrating each other. You know, yeah. if they're not happy, they can agree to disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, period <laughs> that you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so it's, it's nice. To, <laughs> it's nice to see that for them anyway. For sure. Um, and regardless of whether their pops is stash, it's, it's, it's more like you say, um, socially, hip hop, or at least the 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 athletic sport principles of it has been so absorbed into like society. It's got to that point where it's kind of a given, which in a, in many respects, like you lose certain core um, principles, but you gain a ton of values. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I mean, you got to give a little, get something right. I mean, you got to, it's, it's all about finding that balance too, you know, like just, you know, that's a, that's what we do every day. You wake up and you just try and find the balance, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the what's the thing that um what what is the thing that knocks your kids and their peer groups out for six the most? Out of all the things you've done, we're gonna get into some stuff you've done, but what the thing what's the things that they're just you're like, really? You like that? Really? What's the, what's the things? They're all different, you know, like because of the world we live in, the obvious lowest hanging fruit is the footwear. Yeah, you know, people's you know, and, and certainly me, that's what got me into it. You know, my sort of, you know, oh shit, you know, those sneakers are kind of dope right there. I think I need those, you know, like yeah. just that sort of the appeal and what that market has done. Because to me, the footwear led to the clothing, to everything else, because I used to build my outfits from my shoes on up. Everything started with the kicks. Oh, day. So, right. So it's interesting that some of my son's friends and some of the, my daughter, I have a daughter who's five years older than my son and watching them sort of identify with what I've done. That's been out in the world. Could be sneakers, could be a big mural that got a little bit of shine locally, or mm. I'm hearing really cool things about my older graph style. These kids really like the older, you know, like the the eighties, yeah. nineties, you know, when it was like, Oh yeah. Okay. That's like, that's when it was going on. And you could probably, you know, just sort of identify a style or whatever. So for me, it's, it's, you know, a lot of it's like sneakers, right? Because the yeah. footwear, like I said, is such a big deal. Yeah. Even for me, oh shit, my boy just dropped a pair. Yo, I need those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's That's right. Dave Bacon, our boy Dave Ortiz, they just re-released his shoe. You know, I, I needed that, you know. Mm -hmm. so thank you, Dave. You know, Hold tight, Dave. Yeah. So, I mean, it, seeing that with the kids, I get it. There's so much stuff, like I say, I identify with what they're looking at and how they process, you know, and it's all retail therapy at the end of the day. It's all about, you know, the product. So if it's not the graph, it's usually some sort of product I've worked on that could be bathing ape. It's always surrounding the label and the phenomena of an artist worked with a collab with this sort of brand, mm. you know, it's excitement no matter what it is, you know? You know what's really exciting, I guess, 
just not, not only your, your kids, but like I think young people in general, I find it when I see some of your stuff back in the day or, or anyone else from the, the fraternity of that of that time, the, the, the old school style that, the, that people now try and um, claim as a, a naive style for like modern day graph. I really take a shine to it because you can't fake that shit. When you see a piece that's done, not necessarily even on a train, but when you see the the um, the, the photo, the Kodak, that raw image, or you see something that is clearly from the nineties, it it just really puts an, a mark on like yourself as an as an artist and how much you've done and how important it's been for you to repeat the process and the relevance of that from old to now it's just such an in it's always impressive to see do you know what i mean no i i feel the same way and you know i i looked at a lot of archives recently and i've been you know working with a lot of friends of mine artists getting to see how their process is and how they archive and it's it's an incredible world we came from you know and because we live at such light speed we don't look back at that. It's, it's so analog. That's so, oh yeah, whatever. That's in a file. I have that over. Everything's digital. Hang on. Let me share my screen with you. Or So true. And, you know, for that, it's sort of like, hey man, I wish we could slow down a little bit. That's the only thing that I don't like that came with this technology yeah. is that, you know, it's a much faster pace and yeah it's harder to build heritage when somebody is already over it 10 hours later because somebody blogged and said it was whack. And so everybody goes, "Ah, it was whack. Well, is it, or isn't it? Are you just joining the big voice? Are you setting your own mark? You know, there's a, there's a fine line there about how people can stand with the anonymity behind the screen and sort of tough guy up behind the keyboard Hmm. But they have a different voice when it used to be analog and it was eye to eye and you would stand there in the park or the jam or wherever you were, you know, and I think, you know, watching that is sort of interesting too, you know, because, you know, we we just came from a different place. It's just a much harder thing to, you know, people don't engage as easily. They're too busy. Like, hang on a minute. Like, hang on a minute. You know what I mean? Like I just got to, you know, and it's always the excuse, but I'm just checking my, yeah. yeah. What the fuck you doing? Put your phone down, dude. Check this <laughs> out. So I'm in the room. I'm actually in the room, you know, like, and I'm an asshole because I do it too. Many times my girl look at me, but like, for real, I'll be like, sorry, I'm sorry. It's so instinctual at this point. It's like, shim, shim. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. But when you put hey, it in hey, context, I'll be 10 minutes late. No problem. Shim. Hey, I'm doing <laughs> shim. You know what I mean? Like nothing matters, man. It's, yeah, as, long yeah, as, totally. battery life. as long as I got b- good battery life and Wi-Fi, game on, dude. Oh, bro, the anxiety of not having battery. Oh, my God. <laughs> you feel like you can't breathe. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I can't um, make it home. I'm not going to make it home. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Bat, was it? B-A-T, die. Yeah. <laughs> Bat, die, text. Oh what happened <laughs> to you? My phone died. <laughs> Holy shit. Might as well have a funeral for that motherfucker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. I snap on it, but I also am subject to it a lot. Like, oh, shit. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel you. I feel you. And the only thing you can do and tr- trust in terms of um, output and how people perceive it is how you perceive things yourself. Like, are you that guy? Yeah, probably. I'm probably that guy. So I'll own it. I got to yeah. own it. Yeah. I mean, you know, like generally if I'm snapping on it, it's because it's like a deflection of my own truth, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Facts, 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 facts. Um, okay, I'll own it. I'm good. I'll take yeah, it. yeah. Um, to look at the catalogue and history, which I guess you have been doing um, in preparation for, any, you know, book milestones, um, and the attention that people have on um, with new media and books and authentic stuff such as this, right? Do you? I mean, let's let's put this in perspective. I think that I think the first thing that draws people's heads to any picture is association. And although, okay, we like like you say, we snap on things like you know people's attention span. But graffiti was notorious for repeat, repeat that made it really hard for you to ignore. So perhaps that is just the order of the day. But when you're standing there next to someone like Zephyr or Futura, those are those are the real head turners, aren't they? I mean, listen, you just mentioned two of my favorite human beings of all time. Hell and yeah. both of which, if it wasn't for those forementioned two human beings, 
this, probably not. I'd probably be like saying things like, um, would you like fries with that? You know what I mean? Because, and no dis- no offense to the food service industry. I just, man, those dudes, those were my brothers that really put me in, in play and, and shared so much with me. But I'm so glad that I was open to receive it because a lot of us that were in the same room didn't pick up on it the way I did, right? So, why, why is that? Why? You know, some people are like purists. They, nah, I only use spray paint. I don't do mixed medium and I keep my shit right. And that's, that's what graffiti is to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you just closed a few doors to yourself on. Yeah. You know, and not intentionally, you know, I don't know why that is. You know, I was always hungry. I'm hungry now. And yes, I'm thick, but I don't mean with food. I just mean like I'm eager beaver. You know, I will get up earlier than you and I will stay up later than you if it means getting it fucking done. That's what I like to hear. That's that shit. Talk the prop. And I still do that. Like we grew up at a different, listen, the way I grew up, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're fired. Right? So yes, it's that sort of upbringing and sort of thing that's been instilled with me. And I think it's it's the graffiti life. It's, it's sort of like how, you know, the bylaws of the graffiti movement. There's no book. It's not written. It's not. But that's how we dealt with each other. Be fucking real. Do not write a check with your mouth that your ass isn't prepared to cash. Like, just oh, deal with shit. it. Yeah. Like, we used to, yo, you should get a beat down. I wasn't afraid to get a beat down. It wasn't a drive by. It wasn't a bat. Like, if you mouthed off, you had a man up and deal with it. Sometimes yeah. you got lucky. Sometimes you went home and put a stake over your eye. Deal with it, dude. That's the deal. You learn real quick how to use your mouth and be involved. It wasn't like the internet, the Wild West. Everybody could mouth off and wasn't me. Yeah. Dude, I know your handle is blah, 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 blah. Of course it was. You know, like everybody likes to. Uh, it was a different period. And when you get called out the way we used to, you sort of step a different way. Oh, and it's sure. that training that was very helpful to me. I got smacked a few times. I had a big mouth and people had to put me in check and I won't deny that. I'm not going to act like I was the tough guy. No, I was probably not the tough guy. I just had a big mouth because (laughs) I was so wild and trying to do all this shit, you know, Mm. and you got to learn somehow might be with a left or a right. I don't know. (laughs) You know what? It's very, very much in a Gary V kind of sentiment. You know, your action, your, your, your intentions need to match your actions and that, Again, t- testament to your legacy. I mean, I know what you're saying about like, but you were saying just then about you were, uh, you know, maybe you, you had a bit of a gob on you, you had a bit of a mouth on you, and that's what got you. But, but there is a, you know, there's a youthful wisdom to this, right? So as you refine, like it's like fine wine, dude. Like as you get into these zones, what was your big mouth at one stage now is articulated and refined, and you're able to navigate around the, the floor space of an exhibition room without feeling in any way out of water. It's one of those things, isn't it? Life lessons, right? I mean, you know, again, do we, do we take what we've learned and find that silver lining or do we constantly throw your hands up in the air? Well, what direction do you take with it? You know what I mean? It's sort of like, that's on you. You know, I've, I've learned over time, both the hard way and the easy way. Some things just happened. Some things I had to, really work hard for. Mm-hmm. And then you really appreciate those things. You know, it's, it's an interesting place to be. It is. You know, and people, we were people, here before MTV and bling and all the other shit. We, we didn't have the luxury of sending PDFs through the internet. When I wanted to sell t-shirts, I had to get on an airplane, knock on your door at the store and be like, look, I'm making t-shirts. Yeah. You know what I mean? We didn't have that luxury. I came from a more of a doer sort of, not that heads don't do now. I'm not disrespecting anybody, but I think I you. you understand what I mean. We had less of less things at our fingertips by way of internet and passing information. You had to physically get out in the world. Mm-hmm. Even if you had a pen pal, you had to write the letter, right? Yeah. You had to lick the fucking stamp, yeah. right? You had to go down to the mailbox and put it in there. Yeah. There's always some sort of effort we made. You know, it's a lot different today. I heads think we've, I think we're very lucky in that respect. I do too. I'm ble- I, I would hate to be now. Yeah. I look at my kids and I go, Ooh, I'm sorry. Damn. But I can't <laughs> do timing. <laughs> I wasn't here earlier enough to bring you in. For my- like, this is just how it worked. You know, like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes and no. It's like, yes and no. Some things I'm like, damn, wow. Amazing. But some things like, no, because the day to day, the executive function, the like, 
we left our house when I was my children's age, when the sun came up, we would get back to the block at sundown just to check in. Yo, mom, I'm going to be on the block with Sammy and this guy and that guy. All right. Oh, don't leave okay. the block. You know what I mean? We didn't, you know, you can't get these kids out of the house before sundown. You know what I mean? They're sitting yeah. there. Nah, 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 nah. You know, everything is like, you know, in a minute. I mean, I've never heard the term in a minute so much. <laughs> Come here. Right, give me a minute. Yeah, give me a minute. Yeah, you know what? I, I sometimes when I go down this cul-de-sac, I'm like, yo, I sound like an old head. But then a little bit of me is kind of like, you know, I'm all right with this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I, I, I showed a friend of mine a photograph the other day, like we're going through the archives and a, a guy named Wayne One, another graffiti artist from New York, New York, yeah. my mind, one of my oldest friends. Uh -huh. I showed him a photograph and I said, you know who this dude is? I was just testing his memory. A mutual friend of ours who wrote Cyst back in the day, but he didn't even call out homie in the photo. He was like, is he on like a, an analog phone with the cord? And the, he was just like, yo, there's a mad old photo with the forensics on like the setting of the photo. Like forget Jason in the photo. He's like, dude, that's like a, that's, that's gotta be like in the eighties. You got like a, he's on a regular telephone. Yeah. You know, I try to explain to my kids like, yo, dude, you couldn't leave the kitchen. You were like a, you, you barely got around the corner if you needed privacy. What are you talking about? Like, dude, do you know when you just said that? You know what I thought of? I thought of Roseanne, you know, like on the Roseanne <laughs> comedy when she had the long extension lead on the phone and was walking yeah. around the whole house. And <laughs> yeah, no, everybody did. You stretch, used to coil and it stretched itself out. Like, no, nah, man, like, come on, we come from a way different time, dude. <laughs> and it was amazing that in that photo, what I was just saying, like in all this modern time with everything whipping. Here I am going through, like you said, those beautiful rounded corner 70, 80s photographs that I've documented and have like this crazy archive. And dude did forensics. He's like, is he on like an analog phone? Oh, shit. Like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, and that's the kind of thing that I was like, wow, yeah, that really, I didn't even think about that. Uh, well, this is the thing. Our, our, our timelines merge, don't they? When, when you were mentioning about showing up with product to a place to try and sell it or you know physically get people with a flyer down to a uh down to an exhibition hall or you know bring it to their face on a train you know these things when spinning it in within these modern day type marketing um angles it's actually you'd be missing some tricks if you didn't you know you've kind of got to be if some people have got a reverse engineer or used to be going on in the back and day while other people have to push forward on what can be attained with new technology for the now, isn't it? Yeah. Come on. People are all, it's like a Rubik's cube, dude. Mm -hmm. Got the yellow and the blue beautifully, but the red and white are all fucked up and it doesn't yeah. make sense on how that, how that is. How did we land on this one? Like, hmm. yeah. so, you know, it's only getting harder. There's only more obstacles in our way and hoops to jump through to, to get yeah. to the final process. But you know, hey, what was your, what was your first experience like of uh, what was your first experience like of the exhibition hall? I mean, you know, we're we're now talking a few years yeah. after the fact with the with the trains and the and the the, the culture embracing you. What, what what was what was that like? It, it was it was a real mind fuck for me because I was I was. I live not far from the fun gallery, which was the gallery of that time in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And although there were other galleries coming up, that was the most neighborhood friendly. They invited everybody in. You meet all the artists. That's where I first met Fuge, Zeph, Don, rest in peace. I mean, Eero, rest in peace. I mean, so many artists I could throw at you. Wow. That was really such a big jump off. And she, Patty Astor, when I say she, pardon me, Patty Astor, who was the gallerist, actress, woman that started it, Mm -hmm. she invited a bunch of people like neighborhood artists. If you were serious about what you did, please do a canvas and submit it to us. We're doing our annual Christmas show. Wow. You know, and I was invited to be in a, in a show in the fun gallery. And that's when I realized like, Hey, wait a minute, I got to learn how to do this on this with that. You know, like I was, it was a yeah. lot of, there was a lot of uh, self-discovery for me personally. And it for wasn't sure. just the part of showing. It was like, how do I, how do I do a piece and I'm as psyched on the way, same way I did my graffiti and stand in front of it against all these other artists, you know, there's a little bit of pressure. 
because yeah. I knew it was going to be a big group show and I'd already seen the caliber of shows they've done and it was real and mm -hmm. I wanted to be I wanted to be taken seriously so I took it seriously Stash yeah. man I mean this was this was of a time correct me if I'm wrong again this is all one big timeline but um you know there, there must have been like the Keith Herrings and the Basquets and all these different characters that were coming from different angles in the arts worlds it must have been quite you'd you'd have to put position yourself in a particular way or weren't you thinking that deep you were just you were concentrating on the practicalities there was a lot of things going on that you were had to figure all out, I right? cared about was representing myself with with a piece of artwork that I would hang on the wall. You know, it's the same way of like when you do a piece or try and you know start tagging. You want to get a style that you're psyched on, mm. create your own identity, create your blueprint, your thumbprint, or what have you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, getting to do that first piece was like a big style definer for me. Like, you know, okay. Here we go. I know how to structure letters, but I had a few problems. I didn't fit my piece completely on the canvas. It was like S T A and then S and then like half the H was like just gone. Like, yeah. okay, that's interesting. <laughs> but you know, Hey, I still submitted it. It hung in the show. It, it, it did. It's, you know, it's, it's my worth some money now, you know, that, that one yeah, piece. No, I mean, it's, I still have it in one of the boxes. I definitely mm. still have that one. Wow. Sure. I have a couple of really oldies. I, I unfortunately lost, I mean, a really big part of my life in a storage bin. You know, I had, unfortunately, a time in my life where I was at 18 on my own. Right. And everything I had, I put in a storage room and there was a, a flood in oh. the storage place. And I came back and everything I owned was like a big wet puddle. Oh, so I lost shit. like mad black books that I had obtained during you know, a good amount of these years we're talking about, I have fragments of oh, my own man. personal stuff that got just destroyed. Oh, dude. So. <sighs> Can you imagine what? Well, well, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've had plenty of decades to contemplate that one. Um, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, 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 exactly. <sighs> um, Slave to New York, that um, movie. Um, Slaves of New York, yeah. Slaves of New York. I mean, it was a very underground movie over here. But when I think of like the time, it it, it totally was. It was it was a it was like a a scoop of a, a of of a time just like put into a movie. It's looking incredible. And we uh, ex explain that scenario. Explain how that came about. And um, yeah, how real was that? In New, New York, was such a creative haven back then. You know, it's weird. The um, the book was written by a woman named Tama Janowitz, you know, that they made the movie of. Mm -hmm. And I guess she was like a downtown artisty sort of socialite lady. I don't really know so much of her, but that period of time in the early 80s in Danceteria, that was the club. Early Madonna, a lot of like rap venues came through there. A lot of early dance and, you know, Lisa Lisa and all that mm -hmm. shit, right? So it was an mm -hmm. amazing period of time. But for the graffiti artists, I used to spend all my afternoons in the club. I was friends with the people in the club. I could spray paint in the basement. And during the night, we used to tag on everybody. You'd see a lot of jackets now that are in museums that are like leather outfit or leather MC jackets bombed by all sorts of famous people. But if you look in between, there's like my name and a bunch of other local, you know, um, um, you know, uh, artists, you know, of the time that were part of that. Yeah. And so when, when the movie was coming out, I had heard about the book prior to the movie and the artist's name in the book was Stash. And everybody was like, yo, homie, that's you. But in actuality, when I met, Tama Janowitz, she explained to me that it's actually pronounced Stosh, which no means Stanley, Stanley in Polish is Stosh. No. I know this sounds like I'm blowing smoke right up everybody's, right up the internet's butt, but this is what I was told. And I was like, wow, it's kind of a coincidence that there's a graffiti artist named Stash in this movie and your book with a Dalmatian because I actually own a fucking Dalmatian, all right? So what? It what? Was, it was... <laughs> It was very crazy, right? Serendipity. So, what? Now, but here's what's crazier. Like, I was working for a friend of mine who was like a set builder. He worked in production 
but he was a set builder. Mm. He turned me and goes, hey, yo, they're making a movie. I, I should introduce you to these guys. And that's how I sort of managed to sort of be part of that. Now, I wasn't the stash in the book, but I did the title credit that pops up in the beginning of the movie. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I'm in the movie in like a gallery scene, but I'm like writing Zephyr's name and different people's name, like in a club or gallery setting, tagging on the black leather jackets. Like I told you, that was like a thing back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in the movie, I'm sort of doing that. Crazy. What a, what a weird bunch of dynamics. That's so crazy. Um, when you see Graf, or at least a, 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 you know a hat tilt to Graf by a director or you know producer of a movie, it for the likes of us who are hip hop heads, it kind of acts as a an okay sign. Do you, do you know what I mean? But it does, but it also can fuck with your mind on the continuity, right? True. So, true. For instance, okay, I'm going to give you, you just triggered something, so bear with me. <laughs> yeah. You might like this, you might edit it, I don't know. But like, <laughs> because of what graffiti does, it time stamps, no matter what it is, could be a style, kind of spray paint, how it's done, where it's done. There's a lot of variables, right? Yeah. So now here we are, you watch a movie and it's like Hoboken, 1967, or whatever the little... Mm. Thing comes up they want to set you in a place yeah. but you're looking and you're like yeah but that's a that's a throw up that's like on broadway they just dressed up this part of the neighborhood to look like hoboke in 1967 so true but you're looking at the graffiti that somebody just didn't turn a blind eye to and didn't realize like that that fucking uh whatever I can, I'm trying to think of a name's throw up shouldn't be there and yeah, first, yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all they didn't do throw ups like that in 1967 First of all, just that alone. But then <laughs> location of like, no, that's not Hoboken. That's an active piece right now, just above where your set was that's still in camera. You know, so things like that really bother me personally because I'm like, no, but that's. Bo, that's I am so with you. It's great. <laughs> it's little things like those aren't the Jordans from then or not yeah. even. I saw this documentary the other day where they were trying to do an example of something, something to do with some hotel in downtown LA. I forget what it's called, but the standard. that's the one. Right. And they were using these kind of throwback, you know, what the girl did before she died kind of scenarios. And uh, she, that wasn't a 2011 laptop. That was right. this, you know, 2011. <laughs> I got one. I don't like that. I can't do it. I can't do it because that's, that's what I mean. We're all like sort of purists in our own way. We all know we came from the same mm -hmm. All look at the same. We all use the same shit, the tools. I mean, come on. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, so graffiti to me is such an amazing timestamp that, yeah. you know, hey, all you set directors and, you know, movie people, be aware, you know. Yeah. Because you could have the you could you could have the nineteen uh, right, nineteen ninety two graffiti, um or no, actually, let's let's go somewhere else, you know, Subway, you know, like, or Echo Unlimited and things like that. You know, this whole kind of 94, 95 flex. Um, but then if you've got like those graffiti writers from that era and you're doing something that falls in line, not only have you got the fashion, but then all of a sudden you can't just throw a tag up because you've got to have the authentic paint as well because oh, it's yeah. got to look like it. If you're going there, you got to go there because you will be yeah. called out on it. You got to, if you're going for the Bronx in the 80s and you don't have Tats crew, you shouldn't be in the Bronx in the 80s. I mean, it's just take it somewhere else, homie. Exactly. Just, hold tight, hold tight the Tats crew. Hold tight by hold tight. Oh, I mean, the, 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 there's some names. Well, you know, how influential were these people for you? Um, because as we went into the 90s, they were very interestingly, like Tats really took on the um took on and embraced uh, a more industrious approach, you know, collaborating with MMs and Coca-Cola and things like that, right? Um, how influential was that for you? to see crews and, and people like that do full productions with, with companies. I mean, it's, it's exactly how it should be. Yeah. You know? I agree. They dictate their own terms. They created their own scenarios. They went and got their own work. It wasn't given to them. Uh -huh. You know, they are probably, they should have their own cable TV show. I've worked with Tats crew on many, many different gigs. I've also been in the yard with Tats crew when it was Tats crew, like a subway bombing crew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough on one of my outings to have seen what and how these kids roll in the real, 
in the jungle, wow. if you will. I was on the front line and, mm -hmm. and I am so impressed with who they are as people. And they are some of the nicest motherfuckers I've ever met. Nicest human beings on the fucking planet. Out of control. And, but they are like, you do a gig. I've done gigs. I was fortunate enough at that period when they had sort of started their business and went out and doing that, I had my own store. And I hired them many times to help me with windows or, hey, I got a wall we want to hire you guys to do for the store. I've never laughed so hard in my life or had such a good time listening to the three <laughs> of them work together. I mean, they are just really amazing humans. Let's Banter. move on. I can't stick my nose any further up Tats Crew's ass right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they just helped. great, man. And they're amazing artists. Just absolutely incredible. Yeah, they helped. They helped. Um they helped build that bridge into into what was considered class and um, authenticity like the raw end and then bringing it to like you say rightly so into the the um, more media spotlight like source magazine having actually having graffiti in it <laughs> and coming well, from you know you know back in the day when source was really jumping off it was i think chino another mutual good friend of Hold ours tight chino, chino. the um photo editor who yeah. has sort of got them to really, you know, say, Hey man, we gotta, we gotta get some graph up in this thing on a realistic way, not just on an end note. And mm -hmm. he, he put together a really great thing for the source. I think shout out to Chino. Chino hold tight. Yeah. Oh, dude, so, I mean, I've had a few things from back then in there through Chino as well. So that's why I want to shout out John Schechter, the old editor, Max, all these guys. I mean, what a, what a crazy, I think Hawaii Mike came from source. There's so many, interesting people that went on to do such great things you know that came from but yeah magazines definitely came to the forefront i think it felt like um the, the street fashion which you clearly embraced and took to the mountain but that kind of added an extra angle into these publications because you were able to you you know the marketing campaigns of course they lent heavily towards the clothing and the the graph and the what's going on on street culture on the corner but um yeah it just felt like it had its it was it became its own division of graph it was it's pretty crazy at the time i mean i think it was just another form another extension of expression right and mm. so for me what i saw happening at the time really Sean Stucy opened up the floodgates because oh. what he yeah. did to that movement and what is still today celebrated. And I don't think really spoken about the right way because there's Stussy, the company, and then there's Sean Stussy. Mm. And so forget Stussy now, not forget, pardon me, rude. I'm just saying like, Hey man, Sean Stussy to me is the godfather or the architect behind what today is known as streetwear. Classically, he's surf, all surf. And he did everything from shaping surfboards to designing the gear, logos, shops. I mean, he's so thoughtful in his mm -hmm. process. And it was, that's what I took notice of, watching all that gear pop up and realizing like, hey man, it's not all about hibiscus prints and all that stuff. He, he put a hand style on it. He put a little of his wit and tongue into it, you know, mm -hmm. have a good vibe, you know, all his isms. Yeah are so celebrated in so many ways or bitten and forgotten because you either, you know, get it or you don't, but that mm -hmm. to me is the origin of, you know, that, that's what I took notice on, on, Hey man. Okay. Okay. I see, I see it. We could, you know, we can have fun with this. There's not, you know, the, it just sort of like it took the rule book and just sort of ripped it in half of what you thought of mm. when you, to my mind personally, what I thought of was, one, two, three. Oh, we can go one, three, mm. come back to two, round it up and bring it back. You know, like there was such an amazing sort of visual play to what he did. Yeah. That to this day, I'm, I'm so thankful to have seen that happen because again, all this, like I said about Sean, I mean, uh, Zeph and, and Lenny and, and this and that, Yeah, you know, there wouldn't be any of that stuff if Sean didn't do that. Because, you know, his gift to the world is still ongoing. I mean, it's out of control. Challenging the status quo. I mean, what was fashion and what is fashion? Who fuck knows these days anyway? And, you know, and, and that's, that's to be celebrated. But like you say, of its time, this was so... Um, th it was, there was something about you guys taking on the, the fraternity 
the uh, that that it kind of felt like as anarchic as Graf is. It was like you guys have got the skill sets, and hey, fuck you, we're gonna do it in fashion as well. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I I think you know we we're just sort of some of us. The choices we made were based on what was happening in the times, and just sort of rolling with what's going on. And sometimes you were in stride. Sometimes you missed the boat completely. I didn't, I didn't start making t-shirts for anything other than I wanted a Krylon t-shirt and they didn't make them. <laughs> I bought a silk screen kit and I made Krylon t-shirts. Nobody knew what the hell they were. Like, you know, that, that, that was my fascination in the beginning, you know, and then I realized, Oh wait, we could, we can make money to do this stuff. We but, but oh, do you know how hard that is? Do you know how sick that is? Like when, when I see at that time, when I saw someone wear a Krylon t-shirt, yeah, I just felt like this personal identifiable connection with you like, yo, I know who you are. Cause you wear that. That's cool as fuck. You know what side your bread is exactly. buttered on. And that's, that's why I made them. It was like, you know, we, we identify with, you know, it's like the same way we play on pop culture, hmm. repeating movie quotes or all our favorite, you know, rap lyric. There's always a hook that we're like, becomes part of our day-to-day vernacular. You mm-hmm. know, it's that same thing. It's like when I made the Krylon shirt, it was like, well, you can't get them. I'm in an art supply store. And I'm like, what's that silk screen? What does that mean? Oh, I can print anything I want on shirts. Can I do this? And I showed the guy, he goes, yeah, you can do that. I said, all right, well, sell me that kit right there then. Let me go make some of these shirts. <laughs> and I did. And that's how, that's honestly how it started. Rest in peace, Pearl Paint on Canal Street. People that are listening, no New York, no Pearl Paint. I made my first Krylon shirt and, you know, silk screen some of them in Zeph's house. You know what I mean? Like, and gave them out to like all the homies, Lee, Fuge, Don, you know, any of us, you know, that Days, Crash, you know, just... You know, and a, and a group of other local heads that don't have any relevant, revel, you know, uh, relevance. Relevance. Thank you. I tripped up on my I own. I think word. so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 and, and, I, I, and, I, I, I disagree. Carry on. <laughs> yes, I concur. And so, yeah, we just it was it was friends and family. You know, I didn't even realize I could sell them. I was just psyched to learn how to make them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, yo, I'm making t-shirts. Yo, what size are you? I'm gonna bring you a t-shirt. What? what? You do what? <laughs> You so again, that the relevant the the creative process is paramount. That's the first thing. You're not even thinking too deep about anything else. It's all about the process. It's always been about the process. What, you know, when we talk about collaborations, a lot of what excites me is like I've never got to make that. I want to see how that works. Mm-hmm. It's not oh stash x blah blah blah. It's more like oh man, I've never gotten to do that. I want to see the pro. Oh wow, that's what a great new thing for me. You know, and I'm always, it's like, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm 53. Okay. I've been around the block. I've been around the world a few times. I've seen a few things, but I will always stop in any airport or anytime there's monitors that have that Coca-Cola bottling plant where you see the bottles on the conveyor belt and and cat, you're always so fascinated at product and, and the way it's made. There's that show, how it's made. I don't know if it happened in the UK, but yeah, we do. Yeah. You're flipping the channels. You're like, I never seen how boat sails are made. Let's have a look at that. You know, that's very interesting. You know, like something very fascinating about process. So when I get included in a project that brings new process and technique into my library, you've got me completely. I'm like, all right, hang on. I've never gotten to this. Can I, can I see how that works? Not just the design. Don't just send me the spec sheet. Let me, how are you doing that? Like, get how, into you know, it. Yeah. I want to know a bit more. I want to know. <laughs> I think that curiosity though, um, which is, become the constant in the, the the development of you as a person as an artist i think that same curiosity is what holds an audience certainly for me you know knowing you i knowing your work it's just it's it's like um oh I'll stash up to oh shit do you know what i mean it's like constantly doing stuff <laughs> it keeps the audience there yeah. I mean, I, I'm, man, gosh, I, I took a little time off, you know, life got in the way of doing what I'm doing. Mm. And I'm, I feel so blessed. Like I almost feel like the Phoenix rising, being able to come back and, you know, after I put my brands to rest and shut my store and had a couple of obstacles to deal with still being able to work with different brands and be celebrated alongside of these brands is amazing. Yeah, you know, having sure. that is just, you know, the audience has been so 
giving and, mm-hmm. and, and it's great to be part of something that has this kind of legacy, you know, brother, I won't keep you any longer. There are some paints in that back there that need to get sprayed. Yeah. I got to shake every can before I use them. So that takes a while every day. Yeah. <laughs> Cracking. Thanks for spending hey. time, dude. Come on. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know everyone that's out there listening and really appreciates and values your time. Thank you so much, Stash Superstar. Later, B. Have a good Killer one. Killer Keller podcast. <laughs> I like it was our fashion. Big shout out to Stash. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Peace.